And with that, uh, I'm very happy to introduce our, our first remote speaker, which is Angie Laird, who is in Florida, and will uh, tell us about meta-analysis and reproducibility. Take it away. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much to Neuro Academy for having me back again. Um, I really, really, really wish I was there in person. And unfortunately, the timing of my family stuff this summer prohibited me from doing so, but hopefully I'll be able to make it in subsequent years. But in the meantime, I'm delighted to go ahead and give you guys uh, a, a, a bit of a presentation about meta-analysis and reproducibility. Um, and as you see in parentheses, I, I kind of went ahead and tacked on in responsible data use. There's been some um, evolving conversations that I've been having with people over the past year that I, I wanted to kind of emphasize that point as well, because I think it really kind of takes everything full circle for me. Um, uh, being the first remote presenter is a little scary, so hopefully uh, hopefully this will go well. Hybrid is always, always fun, so um, please, yes, do grab that microphone and, and yell at me if you want to stop and ask questions along the way. Okay. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, I am Angie Laird. I am a professor at Florida International University in, um, uh, it's in Miami. We've got a horrendous thunderstorm going on right now as we speak. So hopefully we will all stay online and this will go smoothly. Okay, so starting with the conversation, um, I wanna introduce meta-analysis as, as the first topic here. And, and whenever I do that, I always go way, way, way back to the beginning because our community is having a lot of conversations right now about reproducibility. Um, but before the so-called reproducibility crisis, we've been interested in consensus across studies for many, many years now, uh, back when our field was actually conceived and, and, and people first started pushing papers out. So I like to highlight these two, I call them proto meta-analyses um, back in 1993 and 1996. And for me, these really illustrate that there, from the dawn of our field, there were these early pioneers who from the very beginning, they wanted to look at consensus in neuroimaging studies and compare activation patterns across multiple studies to determine where there was agreement and, and often where there wasn't agreement. And so methodologically, the, the focus across these early studies was really very simple. They just plotted coordinates of brain activation patterns and qualitatively assessed convergence and location. Um, and so again, my point here is that, you know, when you're thinking about reproducibility, meta-analysis is, is a tool that can kind of help give you insight into um, reproducibility in the sense that any single study has a number of different limitations. We um, frequently use small non-representative samples. If you're doing bold fMRI, you're, you're working with an indirect measure of neuronal activity. Our literature is chock full of isolated findings. There aren't a lot of replication studies out there. We have a culture that, that uh, you know, has issues with rewarding those who focus their work on replications. Um, and then, as I'll get to later on in the talk, there are also, uh, there's a lot of variability due to experimental design, and there's a lot of variability in results due to the analytic pipeline. So in just thinking about meta-analysis, one thing um, uh, that, that I want to emphasize is that in coordinate-based neuroimaging meta-analysis, which I'll define next, we're really talking about the question here of where do the coordinates converge in space? Where do the locations converge? Uh, Coordinate-based meta-analysis, it's enabled by two common community standards. The first is that we spatially normalize our brains to a standard brain template. You've heard folks talk about the Taylorek brain and the MNI brain. And then the second is when we report the results of any given statistical parametric brain image, such as uh, what you see here, then we can give you the coordinates, the centers of mass or the peak coordinates for each cluster or blob of activation. Um, and we can report those in standard brain space as an X, Y, Z location. So if you're just flipping through the literature, a given peer reviewed paper is gonna publish a picture of the fMRI activation patterns that you see here, along with an accompanying table. As I mentioned, we call them peak coordinates, um, uh, centers of mass, and these summarize the activation patterns in a numerical sense. They give you a quantitative representation of the brain maps that are produced by the study. So it basically takes this pretty, you take this 3D brain image that you're working with and you condense it down to a 2D picture and then you have these numeric summary of that. So it's a summary of a summary of a summary. Um, and our literature is truly chock full of these map table pairings. 
And from the early days, we've considered how the coordinates can be plotted on the same map, representing results observed across many studies. And so that those two community standards right there really led to the development of algorithms and analysis strategies for formal, quantitative, and coordinate-based meta-analyses in MRI. And so one of the key things that I like to emphasize is that when I say meta-analysis, I'm not referring to the standard effect size meta-analysis that you see in a lot of different fields in which results are pooled to determine if a st statistically significant a finding is observed across studies. And this meta-analysis, it, it has a complex history. There's a lot of different ways to do this, a lot of different issues. Um, and so it's important to stress that when I talk about meta-analysis, I'm really talking about location effects meta-analysis, which instead of asking if there is a significant effect, it asks of the significant effects that are reported across the whole brain, where do they converge in space? And so in coordinate-based meta-analysis, we're really asking where is the consensus? And so at this point, I'd like to do a quick little visual summary of what this process looks like without going into a lot of the methodological details. You start with a collection of coordinates that you've collected from across a group of studies that you want to meta-analyze. They all involve the same sort of task or a similar participant population. Um, but basically, you have a big batch of coordinates and you load them all up into the same brain. And again, these are summary uh, coordinates of the original statistical parametric images. So you can take those coordinates and convolve them with spatial kernel to produce study-specific modeled activation maps. And then you can combine those MA maps into a, a sample-wise map, compare it to a null distribution, and determine voxel-wise statistical significance. So that's, again, just a quick schematic of what coordinate-based meta-analysis does. Now, in terms of available methods, there are several coordinate-based meta-analysis approaches available to researchers. Um, these were really nicely summarized in a 2017 publication. And uh, one thing, another sort of category of meta-analysis is image-based meta-analysis. Um, which differs from coordinate-based meta-analysis. These were nicely summarized in a 2016 publication. Um, you know, this involves pooling the actual statistical parametric images, um, which has better spatial specificity than the peak coordinates, but ask where do the images converge? And so I'll note here that while image-based meta-analysis methods is preferred, given the additional information that the maps offer us compared to tables of coordinates, which are again, derived data summary measures. Um, Image-based meta-analyses are fairly rare. And this is really because a hardworking researcher can dig through hundreds of papers and harvest coordinates from tables, but they can't magically gain access to the original statistical maps. We need the authors to contribute those in order to do image-based meta-analysis. Um, and this is why at this point in the, in the presentation, I always say, look, even if you're not really interested in meta-analysis, when you're drafting your manuscript, when you're, when you're producing statistical parametric images, go ahead and please upload those maps to NeuroFault. That's the home, that's where those types of maps are collected because image-based meta-analysis doesn't really have a future unless all of us are adopting this little bit of data sharing into our publication pipelines. Okay. So there are multiple coordinate-based and image-based meta-analysis approaches available to neuroimagers, and it can be confusing to have your options distributed across different platforms and resources and tied to this database versus that database and written in different programming languages. So I wanna highlight here our new Python-based package called Nightmare. This gives you a central location and common interface to conduct your meta-analyses. This is an open source community-based effort led by Taylor Solo. Um, he'll be giving a Nightmare tutorial tomorrow. So uh, I, I look forward to you all enjoying that. Okay, so that all gets into the sort of background um, you know, available tools. What I wanted to jump into next is to give you two examples to publish meta-analyses just so that you can kind of compare and contrast and see how meta-analysis can work to provide new insight. Okay, so I could tell you that meta-analyses have gotten hugely popular. We've got some plops here that are a little outdated, but basically they show you that interest in meta-analysis is rising. We have so many different meta-analytic papers out there that are really exciting to choose from, um, but I'm going to pick two. 
And the first one is a JAMA paper, a JAMA psychiatry paper from 2015. And in this meta-analysis, the authors performed a coordinate-based meta-analysis of voxel-based morphometry, or VBM studies, and examined gray matter reductions across six diagnostic groups. Uh, this included schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, depression, addiction, obsessive compulsive disorder, and anxiety. This was a large meta-analysis, and it included 193 peer-reviewed articles, and that included over 7,000 patients and over 8,000 matched healthy controls. So despite such a large and diverse diagnostic group, they found that gray matter loss converged in three regions, dorsal anterior cingulate and bilateral insula. And I'll note that when they examined the diagnosis-specific effects, they found hardly any, with the exception of some distinction between schizophrenia and depression and the other diagnoses. But then to help give interpret and, and give some functional context to these findings, they then explored the, uh, let's see, what is this? Yep. They then explored the task-based and task-free functional connectivity of these regions with a parallel series of data mining activities. So basically they took a, a, a plain old vanilla uh, meta-analysis and they kind of bumped it up a couple of levels. So first they examined meta-analytic co-activation patterns using the BrainMap database, which is a coordinate-based database, and identified regions that consistently co-activated with each of the common gray matter loss regions in healthy participants during task-based activation studies. So translating from the VBM structural domain to the functional domain but not limited to any specific task. This was task open to a, a, any number of different task domains. And then second, sorry, second, they investigated seed-based resting state functional connectivity patterns in an existing data set of 100 healthy participants for each of the three regions of interest. And then finally, they summarized these results and examined the conjunction between the task-based co-activations and the task-free resting state connectivity patterns and revealed a tightly connected common neural substrate that included bilateral anterior insula, dorsal anterior cingulate, and thalamus. And we've started sort of referring to these complex meta-analytic and connectivity-based pipelines as meta-connectomics. Um, you know, we always got to kind of come up with new words here, but we're incorporating task and rest connectomes from both meta-analytic data and non-meta-analytic data to sort of enhance our overall outcomes. And then this work for us, it really helped highlight the importance of the insula and the ACC is highly connected brain regions that are linked to shared structural alterations across transdiagnostic disorders. And so I want to kind of emphasize that structural piece there, because the second meta-analysis I want to highlight, it's also a JAMA psychiatry paper, this one from 2017, whereas the last one really focused on transdiagnostic structural alterations. This one examined aberrant fMRI activation patterns during cognitive and emotional processing in patients with unipolar depression. So instead of looking across multiple disorders, we focus just on depression. And while the first example meta-analysis uh, results from structural, as I said, the fMRI literature is so much more complicated. There's lots of different tasks that researchers have used to probe depression. Each has its own experimental design and analysis methods. And so here we examine coordinate-based coordinate results from 99 experiments reporting on over a thousand patients. And in this figure, we show red coordinates for increased activations in depression and blue for decreased. Uh, activations for both emotional, that's the top row, and cognitive, the bottom row, tasks. So emotional task on top, cognitive on bottom. Now, when we meta-analyze these coordinates, we found no convergence, not for any specific groups of coordinates we meta-analyze, not for the increases or decreases in activation, not for the emotion tasks or the cognitive task groupings. And I really love this paper for two main reasons. The first, that it's really amazing progress for our scientific community to get null results published in JAMA Psychiatry. Like the culture is changing that we're starting to see a willingness to accept um, null results and not just stick them in a file drawer. But also for what this paper is telling us. We don't really attribute our null results to a lack of a, a meta-analytic statistical power. We know from a previous paper that focused on running simulations that meta-analytic power 
um, requires at least 20 different experiments to uh, meta-analyses meta require at least 20 different contrasts for a well-powered meta-analysis. Um, we believe that it, it almost 100 experiments that we had sufficient power to detect even subtle convergence of, of, of effects. And we, what we ended up concluding here was that the lack of convergence across the fMRI studies was likely attributed to a high degree of heterogeneity across studies, particularly those related to experimental flexibility, which are differences in experimental design and analytic procedures. And so for us overall, this points to an urgent need to focus on replication analyses, particularly in clinical neuroimaging, rather than just continuing to design more and more complex and newer paradigms. And so this highlights with a number of current high profile efforts to shine a light on the strong impact that methodological flexibility may be having on neuroimaging results. And I'm sure somebody mentioned to you the NARPS nature study um, yesterday. And if not, then I'm sure it's coming at an upcoming lecture. So in terms of a transition, I, I do wanna kind of shift to reproducibility um, at this point. And an increasing body of evidence really points to reproducibility issues broadly in biomedical and life sciences. And psychology and neuroimaging in particular are experiencing the so-called replication crisis. And so we, as in our collective community, have published a number of different papers about this. And I've highlighted five of my favorites right here. And a good bit of this discussion has found its way into mainstream media outlets, which always makes the discussion more interesting and more complicated. Um, and so at this point, I like to show everybody my favorite treat, tweet from earlier this year. I don't really wanna talk about the dead salmon anymore. What I do wanna do is reframe this. I wanna focus on the future and talk about what we can do to address our reproducibility issues moving forward and reframing this as a reproducibility opportunity. So sure, we, we understand now that some of the things that we've done in the past haven't held up very well, but that's okay. We're gonna focus on the future. And to do that, I am gonna talk about some resources for reliable, reproducible and replicable data analyses. And our community as a whole has collectively been working on strategies for this for the past several years. And to help us illustrate the three Rs, uh, we're gonna use the infamous Spider-Man pointing meme, which No Way Home thankfully has replicated itself for us, not just twice, but actually three times, thanks to Instagram. Love this, thank you. Okay, so there are a lot of different resources that are available to neuroimagers, and I like to think of them as being divided into three different categories, and the first of which is guidelines and recommendations, and moving through some of the papers that I think that are really, really important in this domain. The first one I wanna to point to is the one by Cobetus. This is the Cobetus report that was developed as a committee from the Organization for Human Brain Mapping. This is, I think the, the actual, the formal title, uh, Best Practices in Data Analysis and Sharing. I can't remember the, what the acronym is, but this is Cobetus. This gives researchers clear and detailed guidelines and standards for promoting reproducible research. Um, in addition to this being a really comprehensive document that puts together the lifespan of a data set, there's also a really smart table at the end that addresses reporting for experimental design, data acquisition, pre-processing, and statistical modeling. It is really easy in the rush to get a manuscript out to kind of forget what you're including in your method section and what you're not. So it can be really helpful to kind of keep this table open on your desktop and just scroll through it as you're drafting your method section to make sure that you get all of the details that you need to be including in there. Okay, so the next I encourage everyone to read a pair of papers that gives a practical and accessible overview of open science research practices for making research more reproducible and transparent. And then specifically as it relates to using some of the large open data sets that are, are, are out there for you to use, there's two recent papers that I love that get lots of hands-on details and suggestions. The first being broadly about working with large scale data sets. And the second is a preprint, I'm not sure if it's been published yet, that focus specifically on working with the ABCD study data. And then as data sets increase in size, researchers have concerns about their institution's local computational infrastructure. Maybe it's not sufficiently robust enough to handle data from thousands of participants. 
um, this is this is a huge shift for many of us who used to run scripts on our desktops with just a few participants. I'm I'm somewhat shamed to say that my very first paper um, back in I think 2000 had five participants in it. So you know there, there's been quite a shift over the past few decades, and as we analyze more and more participants. I'm highlighting here uh, some papers that discuss resources for science in the cloud, which encourage you users to use containers, cloud computing, cloud data services to conduct large scale connectomics analyses. Um, the second one focuses here on Amazon Web Services or AWS to run neuroimaging workflows. Um, I like this one because it gives helpful instructions for benchmarking time and estimating costs because this can be a big, big issue as well. And then I want to highlight one more. Um, this is a unique but super helpful resource. Uh, the Horian paper that I highlighted in the bottom left, it's a traditional journal article, but they've also published a companion resource as a star protocol. This is a real recipe style protocol. It doesn't waste any time with large chunks of descriptive text that can be often cumbersome to read. This really gets into a detailed step-by-step -step process of what you need to do and consider when working with large open data sets. It's a really practical resource. Okay. So the second category of tools and resources that I want to focus on are standard software and data management. We could do a whole seminar just on these. And honestly, I think that's a lot of what Neuro Academy offers you. So I'm not going to go into any great detail here, but I want to highlight what I think are the go-to resources for us. Um, and if anything is unfamiliar here, then I definitely recommend that you check it out. Uh, the first is neuroimaging data standardization. This begins with clear specifications for file formats, includes data organization um, and data specification. Then we have uh, this community. We've really seen the emergence of really awesome turnkey data pre-processing and analysis software and tools. Um, and then data lab is available for data management and versioning. And I know that that's a big part of what you'll be learning about this week as well. So other tools that for me and many others have become a part of our daily lives include those for text and code, data visualization. The coolest thing that you can do is take an amazing analysis and then and then put together a visualization that just makes it go pop and makes your readers go, oh, I get it. I see it. I feel it. Um, and then project management with Open Science Framework and GitHub. OK, and then the third category of resources relates to training and education. And I give this slide in multiple different contexts, so it's fun for me to give it here in Neuro Academy. Uh, one of the most exciting and rewarding aspects for me of the open science movement is the diverse range of training opportunities that have sprung up in various places where researchers can come together to learn data science skills and work on collaborative projects. Um, and so you can see here I've got Neuro Academy front and center. Uh, I love the Brain Hack organization, Neuro, Neuro Match, and then the OHBM Open Science Special Interest Group. If you haven't participated in um, OHBM OSIG, then I highly recommend you check them out. And then I want to also mention a course that I developed in collaboration with my Repronym colleagues. Um, it focuses specifically on the ABCD data set. That course has ended, but all the course materials are going to remain online and accessible for others to use from. Okay. So now you've been given the background on resources and tools, and you're ready to analyze your data. What data are you going to analyze? I wrote a paper last year that covers advances in large open data sets for connectomics research with considerations for reproducible and responsible use. And in this paper, I generated a table that listed some available data sets. It's, it's not exhaustive because our field is really rich with a lot of available data. And it's also hard to organize such a list. Our field is really diverse, and so are our data sets. So I generated a representative list that are organized by three main categories, uh, healthy young adult data sets, lifespan data sets, which span infant, child, adolescent, and older adult periods of the lifespan, and then dense sampling data sets and data sets featuring many tasks and experimental measures. And, you know, there's just so much data that are available to you all, it can get really overwhelming. Um, I do think that there are other papers out there that provide a more comprehensive and detailed overview of, of available data sets. And because there's so much out there, this is hard to do. The field changes rapidly. We're a global community. And in my paper, I cited a bunch of papers that I think are important, but I want to highlight this one on the, on the right that I think is particularly good. And that's a review by Chris Madon. 
he generated a really nice figure that illustrates how available data sets vary in terms of the hours of fMRI data per subject. And this really lets us visualize that important trade-off between the number of participants and the number of trials slash hours slash stimuli. Maybe you want to run an analysis on thousands of participants, but maybe you want really deeply characterized participants and you don't need that many. So this is something to be thinking about when you set out what your research question is. Okay. So next up, I want to address methodological and analytic flexibility because we know it contributes substantially to reproducibility issues. And so to make a few points, I'm going to use our friend Loki's recent journey into the multiverse as an illustration. So starting in 2012, we all read Josh Karp's paper on the plurality of methodological worlds, estimating the analytic flexibility of fMRI experiments. If you haven't read that paper, please do go check it out. It revealed to us for the first time that the choices that we make when constructing our analytic pipelines might actually be influencing some of the outcomes of our results. And then in 2013, a great paper by Kate Button and others uh, on their, their paper was on power failure, why small sample size undermines the reliability of neuroscience. This is really good for understanding sample size, effect size, and reproducibility of results. And then in 2020, we have the NARPS paper, which stands for Neuroimaging Analysis Replication and Prediction Study, which showed us that even if we take the same data set and want to test the same set of hypotheses, then different groups are likely to end up with different answers. And so that is the array of analytic approaches that are available to us is so vast and flexible that it's our own analytic multiverse. So from, from the CARP and the NARP studies, we know that the key stages or components of the analysis that are likely to influence results are spatial smoothing, multiple corrections, software package, and denoising. But anytime you talk about analytic flexibility with other researchers, we we'll always get the response of like, it's great that we know this, that's wonderful. Uh, I love knowledge, but what are we supposed to do about it? As just an average researcher who's trying to go about their day producing good, reliable, reproducible results. Uh, or as Mobius asks here, what is reviewer two gonna say about this when they get their hands on our paper? And to be very clear, I don't, I don't really have solid answers to this question yet. We had a, a symposium at OHBM this year that, that talked about this and that offered some pathways forward. Um, but I do, what, what I like to emphasize right now in this moment um, is the first step that we all need to do is talk about this broadly as community and be really transparent about the issues, um, both at conferences and, and be transparent about our pipelines and our papers. And this point is articulated really, really well way back in the CARP paper. To mitigate the effects of this flexibility, on the prevalence of false positive results. Investigators should either determine analysis pipelines a priori, pre-register them, or identify optimal pipelines using data-driven metrics. And here's the kicker. If researchers use multiple pipelines to analyze a single experiment, the results of all pipelines should be reported, including those that yielded unfavorable results. I just think that that's really powerful, really important for us to keep in mind. And then a tweet earlier this year caught my eye that makes another relevant point that kind of points to the future. We have so many amazing folks, many of them you'll hear from at Neuro Academy, who are in our community spending their careers in informatics and software development, and they're making tools for us. And what's next on their agenda is helping researchers make multiversal pipelines accessible for all of us. And that is going to be a really critical step. And then the last quote I'm gonna leave you with is from He Who Remains, from Loki, who said in this lengthy monologue, we're all villains here. We've all done horrible, terrible, horrific things, but now we, you, have a chance to do them for a good reason. And so my advice is to really recognize that our prior results may not be as robust and reliable as we thought at the time. And yeah, I look at my own CV and I think back and I think that maybe we can be the villain in our own story sometimes. But what matters now is that we know this collectively and that we collectively do our best in producing good, solid, transparent research that leverage the very best resources for open and reproducible science that our field has to offer. Okay, so I'm gonna transition a little bit now and focus the rest of this talk on a collection of ideas that relate to responsible data use, which 
honestly, for me internally, really center, centered around issues related to diversity, equity, and inclusivity. I sort of have this mental model in my head that takes me from reproducibility to responsible use to DEI issues. And I talk about this a lot in that review paper I mentioned a, a few slides ago. And in there, I, I discuss ideas related to equity among researchers in terms of research infrastructure and access to resources, particularly computational ones. Um, and I also talk about data and inclusivity among the researchers themselves. But here, I want to go ahead and talk about um, how issues of diversity and inclu inclusivity, yes, are relevant among the scientists who are conducting the research studies, but they're also relevant to the people that we ask to participate in our studies. And I think that it's critically important that we pay particular attention to this as a community. So. It's been more than 10 years since Heinrich et al. pointed out that research studies are overly reliant on weird samples. And if you're not familiar with that acronym, this is Western, Educated, Industrialized, Rich, and Democratic. And although weird samples are not representative of global populations, results from weird studies are frequently assumed to just generalize to all humans. And then you have neuroimaging research specifically, which is a really technically challenging field. It requires significant preparatory work developing hardware, developing protocol, protocols, building research scanning environments. Um, you know, a lot of this work is led by physicists and engineers. So again, the, the, the lead up to conducting a neuroimaging study, there is a lot of work um, that's involved in that. So then you get to the point where it's time to recruit participants for a study, and that's led us to a little bit of a predominance on convenience samples. Convenient samples in the literature are broadly comprised of American or European university students who are more frequently affluent, white, cisgender, right-handed, and, quote, healthy. These samples reflect more on our need to meet the essential methodological challenges of imaging research and really downplay the hard effort that is needed to ensure recruitment of an appropriately diverse and representative sample. But the result is when you look back at our, our entire corpus of literature, it's no wonder that recent studies that look at Western versus non-Western cultures or socio-demographic status reveal huge issues with reproducibility and generalizability in our field. And so, look, I'll be real honest, I read a lot of papers that emphasize the rigor of their recruitment strategies. And, and then I go look up the demographics of their sample and it's like they're absolutely channeling the Agatha meme, right? Okay. What I'm saying here is that we really do need to consider the fact that we are collectively generating a really large body of literature that is derived from relatively not very diverse group of participants in the interest of reproducibility and generalizability. We need to start to rethink our participant recruitment strategy and start also considering the study of brain function as a global endeavor. I say start, and that really diminishes all of the work that is already being done in this. I, what I want to do is shine a light and encourage it and, and, and make it more accessible to everyone. When many of us think about large open data sets, we, we really quickly think about the HCP, the ABCD, UK Biobank, HBCD will be coming online soon. And you know, while writing the review paper that I was mentioning, I spent a good amount of time learning more about the Cuban Human Brain Mapping Project, India's Consortium on Vulnerability to Externalizing Disorders and Addictions, which they call CVEDA, Brazil's High-Risk Cohort Study for the Development of Childhood Psychiatric Disorders, Japan's ADNI, Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative, and the Australian Imaging Biomarker and Lifestyle Flagship Study of Aging. But then from China, we also have the Chinese Color Nest Project, the Southwest University Adult Lifespan Data Set, the Southwest University Longitudinal Imaging Multimodal, and, and other data sets contributed from uh, the Chinese institutions that are in the Consortium for Liability and Reproducibility, or CORE. So there is a lot of data that are being collected out there that I'm, I'm hoping that we can all take greater advantage of in addressing generalizability. But finally, I'm going to end this slide by noting that the advent of population level neuroscience really provides an opportunity for neuroimagers, wherever they are, to collaborate with social epidemiologists to address the lack of representative samples and strive for inclusive enrollment strategies among more diverse and underserved participant groups. So for an example, in the ABCD study, um, I did mention it earlier, uh, FIU, my institution is part of the ABCD study. We are a data collection site. 
And close attention was paid throughout the two-year enrollment period back in 2016 to 2018 to the emerging demography of the ABCD cohort. And we had epidemiologists who daily looked at the cohort and kept us on track to strive for broad diversity across multiple dimensions, including race, ethnicity, family income, and parental education. And when, and this is why I like to talk about this, when it was observed that the sample included overrepresentation of high income families who had completed more years of education, the NIH rolled out additional resources and support, yes, more dollars to sites during the last six months of enrollment so that we could prioritize recruitment of low income families with fewer years of education. And honestly, that is something that I'm really, really proud about with respect to ABCD. So my point is, that inclusion of racially, ethnically, geographically, and socioeconomically diverse samples is likely going to result in a more comprehensive understanding of brain behavior mechanisms, particularly through the lens of cross-cultural global mental health. Okay, so next I want to talk about the responsibilities that we carry as researchers who engage with large open data sets. And pretty much every movie and show, you know, I've been showing a little bit of my little Marvel theming throughout here. And pretty much every movie and show in the MCU plays a bit with the theme about the balance between power and responsibility. And so, yeah, okay, here's Captain Marvel who's gonna help me illustrate my next few points. Our traditional training that as researchers we undergo at, no matter where we are, in responsible conduct of research emphasizes critically important topics that relate to the activities prior to and during data collection such as the protection of human subjects, animal welfare, and laboratory safety. But responsible conduct of research also extends to data management, sharing, and ownership, scientific rigor and reproducibility, and responsible authorship and publication. And increased sharing of large open data sets must be accompanied by heightened attention to ensuring the protection of participant identity including and especially individuals from more vulnerable populations, such as patients with a clinical disorder and or from historically underrepresented groups. In the EU, new regulations have led to the development of the open brain consent, and that's a template that allows for participants to provide informed consent that their data will be shared. These are really, really important. Um, in addition, you know, when you go to download some data, particularly that distributed by the NIH, like the ABCD data, there's a data use agreement process, and it can be a bureaucratic, administrative, heavy load for a researcher to take on. But it also serves a really critical feature in that terms and conditions are laid out in those data use agreements that prohibit users from attempting to identify participants and, and other safeguards for protecting participant privacy. These are really, really important. And then beyond concerns about participant privacy, responsible data analyses require careful planning, becoming familiar with the data acquisition protocols, understanding the limitations of the acquired data. So generally, when, when you're planning to collect study data, you sit down and you think about your research question and you choose the research instrument that best addresses what you wanna ask of the data. But when you're working with existing data, you can't manipulate the study design. The data are what the data are, and the, the scientific process is somewhat reversed. And so the truth, the truth is that, you know, when you don't have to collect data, papers come up faster and, and, and the data are readily available, projects move faster, you can get a move on. But it really is important to make sure that you are asking an appropriate question given that data. And it's up to us to take a moment to pause before engaging with the data really think carefully to ensure that we're asking research questions that are suitable for a given data analyze, a given data set, and then go ahead and start analyzing. Okay, so digging down a little bit deeper into this, I wanna emphasize what I feel are some really important points in our community right now. Prior to any data analysis, researchers must engage responsibly and really consider how their work may have harmful impacts psychologically, socially, economically, or any other way on individuals, communities, and society. This means that we must thoughtfully consider the responsible use of variables related to race, ethnicity, gender, and sex, especially when conducting analyses of neuroimaging data. Neural comparisons across groups of participants, when those groups are constructed on the basis of race or ethnicity, 
that can unintentionally provide support for a biological deficits-based framework, which argues that lower rates of achievement or poorer life income, poorer life outcomes among minoritized groups are the result of so-called biological determinism. To discourage this, it's important that data analysts recognize that ethical conduct and research includes ensuring that analyses prevent further stigmatization, marginalization, and injustice towards individuals because of race, ethnic, or gender status. And so I've outlined here a few factors that may contribute to, to research that include a lack of cultural sensitivity, awareness, or competence, insufficient understanding of the limitations of the data, improper scope, inadequate context and overstating the significance of the findings and some steps to prevent stigmatization on individuals or groups as a result of research include, but are not limited to considering your study inclusion carefully and be as expansive as possible. Don't limit certain groups out of, or people out of convenience or habit. Respect the people whose lives form the basis of your research data. You know, we are all data, data, data monkeys, and, and we're just all really into running analyses, and it's so exciting. And I get swept up in the moment of a new algorithm or a new analysis. And it really is important to kind of take a step back every now and then and ground yourself and realize that you're analyzing data that comes from real life human beings who deserve your respect and deserve dignity. So, um, and then in addition, make sure you understand and appropriately implement your analytical tools, use precise language to describe your findings, really think about how your research might be misinterpreted to the detriment of those you're studying, and consider the full range of factors, both positive and negative, that may be related to the research results so that you can situate those research in, in the appropriate context, and I have more about that on the next slide. Um, I want to point everybody to the uh, All of Us research program at NIH. All of the information on this slide comes from resources that they have developed. They are the Precision Medicine Initiative at NIH, and they are collecting a vast volume of personal and sensitive data. And, and in order to gain access to these data, uh, and researchers must complete training prior to being uh, granted permission to use the data. And, and this is so that they can really make sure that everyone is fully aware of how research can harm historically marginalized groups. So I encourage everybody here to check out their website and download those training materials. I do know that ENDA, um, the NIMH Data Archive is looking into providing additional training modules to folks who are interested in the ABCD, HBCD, and HCP data as well, and that is very similar to this. And then finally, I wanna note two additional related readings. The ABCD study, because of its large and demographically diverse sample, it's really leading the way right now in terms of highlighting these important considerations uh, to the neuroimaging community for preventing stigmatizing research. And these are two particular papers that I think are really excellent, describe these considerations and provide recommendations for how we should be responsibly engaging with these data. Okay. So the last point that I want to make is in is in thinking about the future of neuroimaging research and keeping in mind that yes, this is a global endeavor. Um, historically, neuroimaging studies have gathered basic demographic data that relates to race, eth ethnicity, and sex, gender. That's kind of you know you think about when you're launching a study, you've got a, a quick demo survey and, and you embed it that participants start with that before they move on to the more complex questionnaires and surveys. Um, and even a cursory search of our literature reveals that folks are indeed running analyses that look at differences in brain structure and function along these demographic boundaries. And as scientists, we are just naturally curious to learn more about those differences. But what I want to emphasize to you right now is what we're really interested in are the social determinants of health. These are the things that are having a real impact on human lives, and I believe that are really shaping these differences in brain structure and function that are being reported. The World Health Organization defines the social determinants of health to be the non-medical factors that influence health outcomes, including the conditions in which people are born, grow, work, live, and age, and the wider set of forces and systems that shape the conditions of daily life that have an important influence on health inequities. And so examples of the social determinant of health um, include income, education, employment, food insecurity, housing, early childhood development, and social support. 
And so while neuroimagers have acquired basic demographic data in our uh, past studies, this is an area where we really need to do more work, again, collectively. Statistical models that appropriately contextualize findings through the consideration of the social determinants of health, they're not possible unless the studies are designed to acquire these relevant measures of interest. We can't just go on collecting data on race, ethnicity, and sex gender and call it a day. We really need to en enhance our demographic data collection so that we can contextualize our results. So most data sets do include some variables related to education, employment, and income. But I want to point out to you a nice pre-register protocol on uh, OSF that does a good job of pulling the curtain back and really reviewing a, com a lack of common measurement standards. Um, you know, there's a lot of different ways folks are asking questions and collecting data on uh, in, uh, education, employment, and income. And aggregating the variables then is really, really complicated. And it's hard to construct scores that relate to socioeconomic status, leading to a lot of ambiguity and confusion in the field. So even the things that we're collecting data on, there's room for improvement. But next up, beyond these basic SES measures, we need to do a better job of asking about housing, food insecurity, and access to affordable quality healthcare, particularly in the US. Other studies like the ABCD study are collecting additional measures relate to the social determinants of health in its cultural and environment protocol, um, including neighborhood safety and crime, family and school environment, and ethnic and racial identity. And while ABCD is also measuring parent and youth acculturation, as well as youth perceived discrimination, there are some limitations to these data. Uh, ABCD is a big study. It can't focus on just that. Um, and so there's, there's definitely room for enhancing these sorts of measures in other studies. As a researcher in Miami, um, a community largely made up of people who have immigrated here from the Caribbean and Central America and South America, these are issues that I really think about on a daily basis. And I'm hoping that, that, that my neuroimaging community in South Florida can really contribute to a heightened awareness of, of these issues to the neuroimaging community. And then as the scale and scope of population-based neuroscience studies is increased, scientists responsible for study design are encouraged to consider the inclusion of more comprehensive measures that assess these social determinants of health as a core strategy for understanding how adverse and protective factors, because, you know, Lots of things do engender resilience and protectiveness. How these impact individuals because of biological, cultural, and environmental factors, again, at the individual, community, and societal levels. And then for anybody who is interested in, or interested in this and thinking about how you can add some of these measures to your own studies and feeling a little bit overwhelmed, my final point here is to really say that intentional consideration of the social determinants of health can be accomplished through collaboration involving researchers with expertise studying cross-cultural psychology and or health disparities across cultural contexts. These folks are amazing and I've met a number of them in the past few years and they have spent their entire careers thinking about these measures, testing them, validating them. They're ready to work for us. They see the interest in population-based neuroscience studies rising. They wanna help make sure that we have the data that we need to more fully contextualize neuroimaging results. Okay, so that is the end of what I had planned to discuss to you today. I wanna thank you very, very much for your time. Um, I know I covered a range of different topics and you know, the reality is I get kind of excited about various things. I wanna hit on everything all at once. And um, I hope you were able to follow along on the way and I'm happy to take any questions. Any questions in the room? I can, uh, can I can I ask a question actually? I see no one raising the hand here. So this is Ariel down here. Um, the, there was a slide, could you, sorry, could you share slides? There was one that, that I felt like was really important, but it, it was a bit abstract to me about how to think about the impact of the recent research analysis that you do. So pretty recent, recently in your talk. And I'm, I'm wondering, you, you know, you called out specific variables, which were, if I remember correctly, uh, race, gender, sex, and one more that I forget right now, that one, race, ethnicity, gender, and sex. And I, I'm sort of, I'm wondering if I could press you a little bit here about like to make this a little bit concrete and 
and the, the the thing I have in the back of my mind, and you mentioned that subsequently is, is um, socioeconomic status. And this is somehow, I'm, this is selfish also, because I, I think about this a lot, like in these big studies, like how do we, how do we take into account socioeconomic status as a factor that does affect health without, without doing stigmatizing research? If you have those, something more, a little bit more concrete here. There's like, how do we take that and make that real? So, okay, so I don't think socioeconomic status, it, 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 a focus on that is stigmatizing research. Stigmatizing research really isolates the, the groups that I have here in the box, the racial, ethnic, or, or groups of, of gender uh, status. So looking at particular groups and sort of pitting them against each other um, is, is the part that I, I feel is especially harmful. Socioeconomic status is a social determinant of health. Um, there are individuals at, at across the spectrum of SES that is independent of race, ethnicity, and gender, and sexual orientation, and disability status. So SES is something that's critically important for us to examine. But when we, what I'm trying to get at here is, you know, some researchers are interested in health disparities and they think maybe I'll do a VBM analysis and I'll compare black participants versus white participants. And there again, you're sort of pitting one demographic group against each other. And inevitably you see a conversation that points to, um, you know, poor life outcomes for one group compared to another. And it's suggestive when <laughs> it's suggestive when you do something like white versus black that there is a biological basis for those differences. When really we know from, you know, I don't know, decades, centuries of research that socioeconomic status is exerts an, a, a very meaningful impact on life outcomes that is likely going to be influencing those results. Does, does that help? It does, thank you. Here, I'll walk the microphone over here. Thank you so much for that talk. Um, my name is Victoria. And just like as a follow up to what you were just speaking about, I wonder if you could try to address questions like that, but instead of like pitting black against white, you could take into account like the mechanism of interest, like racial discrimination as a variable um, to determine like differences in health outcomes. And if that would be one way to answer those types of questions. Absolutely. Um, I, and, and, and there is some emerging work that's looked at sort of neural correlates, neural associations for uh, racial discrimination um, that I think are really interesting. The, the one sort of piece of caution that I would suggest is that if you do so, then you do it in a way that centers a, a, you know, participants without comparing them. So the idea that you could look at racial discrimination in black individuals versus racial discrimination in white individuals, uh, that's a very lopsided type of framework for thinking about that. Um, in some of the, uh, in, uh, let me give you an example. Um, right now, I'm, I'm very much anxious for BioArchive to finish processing and upload a manuscript that a colleague and I are working on that's looking at uh, caregiver acculturation in the ABCD study at baseline and how acculturation impacts not just the parents and caregivers in the study in terms of their, their mental health and their outcomes, but how it impacts their children, um, you know, a, a, as, a, as a downstream effect, as a basis of parenting in the family environment um, in terms of both youth mental health and youth outcome. And to do this study, I'm getting to my point, I promise. To do this study, we identified a subset of participants in the ABCD data set that identified their child as either Hispanic or Latinx. And for us, it was really important 
important that even though everyone completed the Vancouver Index of Acculturation and the ABCD study at baseline, we really wanted to focus acculturation, a culture of orientation, and a culture of experiences on Hispanic Latinx participants. And, and to do that, that's, that paper is actually going, is first led by someone who was born and raised in Miami, is a health Latinx health disparities researcher, a cross-cultural psychology, and comes from the Cuban American community in South Florida. So for me, it was really important that his entire framework for thinking about these issues, that that was the foundation for the study, and that we focused exclusively on Hispanic participants, as opposed to contrasting them um, to white kids in the study, non-Hispanic white kids. Um, does that help? I'm getting a thumbs up here. Yeah. Other questions? Are there questions over there on Zoom? I don't see any. And I turn Slack off. Anything on Slack? No. Hi, Melanie. Hi, Angie. Thanks so much for the talk. I actually asked a question on, on Slack uh, for a related uh, topic that you mentioned earlier. So in terms of um, the data sharing, especially with the big studies that you've worked with, I'd like to get your opinion on, on pushback that we have received when we've tried to get colleagues to share their data. And the argument for them is always that, well, data sets that are out there, like, for example, on OpenNOR, or let's say in the ABCD study, there are so many details in the acquisition that get lost when it's shared that I don't want to do that to my data. I want to be involved when my data is analyzed so I can make sure the people do it right that I share the data with. Could could you comment on that and and and, and how to... Uh, how to... Uh, take maybe those fears away or is there an issue there? I think that's an excuse, quite frankly. And I think that, you know, our field has come a long, long way in terms of openness to data sharing, willingness to share data. Not everyone has made the journey. Um, it sounds like you have that it sounds like these colleagues of yours have not made that journey. And I don't know that there is anything that you can necessarily do. I mean, you can have conversations with them. Of course, we should always invite open conversations and be willingness to, to share sides. But I, I gotta just be honest, it sounds like they're a no and that you should consider other avenues. We're talking about the the broader pet community and there's also it's a very very different type of community than fmi so i'm saying always it's a they have a way still to learn you know i think the nih really did a lot um with the hcp and abcd because it was it was written in in the actual funding opportunity announcement the foa that it was a condition of funding and these you know these grants are you, a lot of money are going to these sites to do this data acquisition, but it was a condition of funding that the data would be pushed. And I, I am hopeful that we continue to see more of that. I know NIH wants to see more of that. I know grant reviewers push for it, but you know, there's always going to be, it, the field doesn't, it, it's not just a, you know, an instantaneous transition from a very closed, no data sharing to, to fully open, everybody shares, no one has any reservations. So it's a process. I mean, it's, I mean, I've been having this conversation since 2002, right? Anybody else? There's a, there's a couple of uh, other questions on Slack. Okay, I'm gonna turn uh, Slack. I turned it off because I don't want the notifications. And I don't know if you heard my landline, my husband insists, he's like a dinosaur, he insists on having a landline and I couldn't turn it off. But normally I turn off my cell phone, I turn off my Slack. Do you want me to read those to you? Sure. 
Okay, so Jennifer oh, asked. Thank you to whoever did posted the dead salmon. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, Jennifer asks, would you have an example of a data-driven method of accounting for social health disparities? Would this require collecting specific data on related metrics like uh, socioeconomic status, race, or could you do this with pre-existing data that's commonly included in these data sets, for example, non-demographic data? Yeah, so this is something I actually want to do a review on this in the next year. Um, I've been digging into like what actually is available. Like I'm I'm intimately familiar with the ABCD study protocol. And I have to say that you're interested in all in those sorts of things. Go check out their cultural environment protocol. I will even find you the link um, to that. Um, but they're collecting data on perceived discrimination. Um, Again, you know, the, the uh, uh, neighborhood safety, there's a lot of demographic information about um, education and income. Um, and so I, I really kind of emphasize that ABCD, I think is really leading the way in the robustness of the culture and environment protocol that they have. Um, and here, oh, I can't really do, I guess I'll, I'll do it in Slack. Uh, and then, um, what I want to do is kind of dig in a little bit deeper to HCP, and I know the HBCD is going to have a lot on the social determinants of health when that project starts their data releases. Um, HBCD, for those of you who don't know, is the um, it is it's kind of the baby connectome. It's the baby version of ABCD. ABCD starts at nine nine to 10 years old and goes for 10 years through adolescence. HBCD starts in the second trimester of pregnancy, follows moms through birth, and then scans the babies uh, until they're nine, 10 years old. So bookended, we're gonna get the entire uh, childhood period. Um, anyways, HBCD is gonna have a lot of really good measures on social determinants of health. From there, I really think it's sort of kind of hit or miss. I know that there's a really good study um, that's looked at perceived discrimination and reactivity in the amygdala, and I'll link to that paper in a little bit. Um, it, you know, some folks have designed studies that specifically go out and get measures on some on, on topics such as these, but it, you know, because there is a difference between a population-based neuroscience study that has thousands of participants that the NIH is really sort of bulk funding versus you and your boutique study at your own institution that has many fewer participants, um, there's really kind of a wide spectrum of, of what is available. All I do know is that the NIH is really recognizing that these measures are critically important. And I think not just ABCD and HBCD, but any large multi site consortium based study that they launch in the future, I think will have a really nice robust protocol in this domain. So the answer to Jennifer's question is both. There are some things that you would want to do on your on your own because they're not available. And then there are some things that if you're interested, if you do a little hunting around and digging around, you can find some data that's, that is included. I wouldn't say commonly, um, because I, I think this is something that we're only really just starting to realize is, is truly, truly important. Okay, so then there's another question about uh, meta-analytic power requiring at least 20 different contrasts. Um, yes, contrast is, re is ex referring to the number of experiments. Um, studies, we usually use that name like for um, publications. So you have a publication and they report multiple contrasts or experiments. Um, and so the 20 is for that contrast level. And I will link to you um, the paper that, that ran those simulations. Um, hey, um, I've got a question when you're ready. Go um, for it. So my name is Caroline. Um, I was just, I might have missed this, but I was wondering if there are any papers on like kind of methods to make, have a more diverse sample in your own study. Um, Cause I've definitely experienced, like I live in kind of, I live in Tucson, Arizona and it's a, it's a very, all of my participants are pretty much white, well-educated, weird. <laughs> so I was yes. just wondering. Um, I have a half finished manuscript on my desktop that kind of <laughs> gives some recommendations and pointers. I will say 
the number one thing anybody can ever do. And, and, you know, this is a group of trainees, so this is, isn't necessarily actionable information for you all, but it is something that you can push up to folks who do the hiring at your institution. The most important thing that you can do is hire a staff that demographically matches your intended sample. So here I am in Miami, um, all of all of the staff who are working on and, and by staff, I mean that to be an inclusive term, you know, trainees, students, um, research assistants, uh, professional research coordinators. I, it, it is a concerted effort that we make to make sure that we hire Hispanic Latinx individuals um, who come from the communities that we are trying to research from. And a lot of times it can be really helpful if you partner with someone at your institution that specializes in community-based participatory research. You know, the, the whole thing with neuroimaging is that we work so hard on these complicated technological details associated with signal to noise ratio and, you know, what sequence are we using and what analysis are we using? And, and that means that no one person can do everything. So if there is a, a gap for us um, that we need to be addressing, it is okay to reach out to members across the spectrum of science and say, hey, you know, as an epidemiologist, what, what do you think about this? Um, and again, like we have found a, a lot of help at FIU um, by collaborating with some of our community-based researchers because they are the ones who have spent their entire careers thinking about those sorts of recruitment issues and, and, and how to help and uh, make accessible uh, participant populations that are not just underrepresented research, but but they're also quite vulnerable. We have a lot of HIV research on our campus. And so, you know, there's people who, again, devote their whole lives to thinking about those sorts of issues. So those are those are my two big recommendations is to um, really think about, and again, maybe not something that is actionable for you all, but maybe thinking about hiring practices and how, you know, resumes and CVs are evaluated, um, and then also reaching out to collaborators who specialize in these sorts of things. Thank you. Okay, I think no more questions for now. Thank you so much, Angie. Um, and uh, you're yeah, very let's welcome. Thank Angie again. Thank you all so much. I really appreciate your time and attention. I hope you have an amazing rest of your week. I am super jealous that I am not there. Um, and again, I, I hope you enjoy Taylor's nightmare demo tomorrow. That I figure that'll give you. A, I, I, I scale back a little on my meta analysis talk um, because I think he's going to be able to pick up nicely and give you some hands-on activity tomorrow. All Thanks right. Thank you. Bye. Okay, and we will go for a little break here for lunch and so on. And be back at uh, 1.30 for two sessions of Git, Git from scratch here in Alder Auditorium and the, the, the corresponding Zoom room and um, collaboration. <laughs> That can be stopped by you. But that's why that was muted, because otherwise it just doesn't. Yeah. Okay, that's good to know. Um, I'm probably just leaving this open. Is this the recording? Oh. Yeah.